Introduce John Bartlett and Reba Rubisett. Thanks, Kim. Our presentation today is called Soviet Princeton, and it's about a coal miners' strike that happened here in town in 1932-1933, and it's called Soviet Princeton because there was a great hysteria, particularly in the local paper, about these communists. And you will find out more as the story unfolds. There's a little backstory to this in that um, when we did our book launch here in Princeton, we have a little electronic sign outside of the visitor center. And if you have an event coming up, you can you know, fill in the form and take it to the town hall and they'll play your little, your little spiel for you on the, on the lit up sign. And so I had here as the, you got so many characters, right? You got to count your little characters and blah, 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 blah. So I had it all worked out. Soviet Princeton, the story of a strike. And um, I handed it in and, and a couple of days later I got a phone call from the um, town office. And that was a different, um, administration. different administration than there were, because those guys all got voted out at that time. <laughs> and this must be the reason because <laughs> I got a phone call from, from one, of the, one of the women at the town office and said, well, <coughs> Rika, um, I hate to tell you this, but <coughs> the mayor would really like you to uh, <coughs> change the, uh, the um, thing on the electronic notice board. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, well, Soviet Princeton, you know, I thought it sort of paints Princeton in a negative light. And I said, well, I thought it would attract an audience. She said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, choose your battles. So we had the book launched, but the electronic sign did not say Soviet Princeton. But anyway, today we're calling it Soviet Princeton, and this is the story of the strike. So John is going to set the scene for us. It, yeah, they wanted that to be called uh, Happy Days and Sunny Ways. We thought now Soviet Princeton is a more appropriate title. So. Uh, we have here a map of the, uh, the slave compounds, the... Oh. the uh, the uh, uh, work camp set up in the 1930s uh, to provide uh, uh, places for unemployed single men to go. And why would you want to get single unemployed men out of Vancouver or Toronto or Montreal? Because they feared revolution. The revolution in, in the Soviet Union it was, it was only a few years behind that, and uh, the powers that be were, were uh, hysterical about the notion of revolution and communists. It was an ongoing, in spite of the fact that the party was fairly small and fairly ineffective until the Depression hit, and then they were the only people who organized the unemployed <coughs> during the Depression. These are the camps. As you can see, most of them are in BC. And in BC, the work being done in these camps was uh, the building of the Hope Princeton Highway, in part, the building of the airport just north of town, uh, and, and uh, uh, various employments in the woods. Uh, so this, uh, there, was a, there was a camp at the airport of something like 200 men so when uh, a strike came up in Princeton, uh, these 200 were a sort of a handy renter mob that you could add to any kind of demonstration. <laughs> so, <it> was, <laughs> um, oh yeah, here, here, are the, here are some of the guys. These are some of the Princeton guys at the airport. This is the airport camp. The dog was not unemployed. March 30, 33, yeah. And they lived. The, the first, they had to build their own their own cabins. And when you, see, if you ever saw The Great Escape as a film, or Hogan's Heroes, or any of those, you know the start the style of building that would have been would have been made like a logging camp, like a mining camp, like a refugee camp, like a concentration camp, like a, a young offenders camp, like a, a summer camp for kids. The same old building. <laughs> you could do a nice little uh, theatrical performance with just having the building center stage and someone changing the name of the place. So as you came up from Vancouver, you went through, you came through Tashmi, now called 
Sunshine Valley. Sunshine Valley, and that was that was uh, a, that was a, 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 a holding center for Japanese. It was a holding center for uh, uh, relief camp people, and it became a kids' J. A, was it boys a, reformed a boys' reform? Camp, I suppose, yes, Tashmere. I think Sunshine Valley is more. It was called Boys Town back in my day. Do you want to speak about the inside of the cabin? Yeah. These being government camps, of course, there were no cameras allowed. So all the pictures inside are government approved. So um, these are probably the nicer situations, but still not particularly um, luxurious, I guess you might say. Um, there was a report at the time about the conditions at camp, um, quote, the meat is always the cheapest beef, so tough that chewing is impossible. Eggs are always storage eggs. Now, I was reading that storage eggs. What are storage eggs? I'm, I'm wondering whether it meant powdered eggs, probably powder. I mean, would they have had powdered eggs back in the 30s? Yes. Yeah. They keep them in... Um, jugs or bats or whatever under, under oil and, and so on. It keeps the air from them and they ah, get very okay. stale at the end. Oh, delightful. Isinglass <laughs> is something that they use. Right. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. So anyway, storage eggs. Milk is always dried. Pickles, such as beets, which should be red, may be brown as oak. The same stewed fruit may appear at eight or nine consecutive meals. Bread may be sour, and coffee is known not by any aroma or flavor of its own, but by the difference between it and tea. <laughs> a camp inmate can hardly forget for long that there is no future. He is a failure, that in no sense whatever is he master of his destiny. Even his hours of rising and retiring are regulated. His comings and goings are marked and noted. And you have to remember that these guys didn't know that the Depression was going to end, and they didn't know that there was a war on the horizon which was going to get everybody all employed. This could go on for decades as far as they knew. So you can imagine the sense of hopelessness and, 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 and despair that some of these men must have gone through. You can imagine that, but it was it was the the Communist Party or the communists in the camps, because of course many of these people were politically aware, who brought I think hope, and some of the songs that came out uh, on the cartoons which appeared in their paper, the unemployed worker and then the BC relief camp worker, show how. how enthusiastic they were for the new world that was going to come about once we got rid of capitalism. That this was, the pains they were going through were labor pains. A new society was going to be born out of this. Capitalism, it seemed to everybody at the time, was on the ropes. And it was only the Communist Party which had any sense that stuff was going to change, whether it, you know, to the degree that it did change. Here's a song uh, that was collected by Phil Thomas from uh, a UBC prof who in the 30s was living under the Barad Street Bridge in one of the, uh, one of the encampments down there. Can I sing with me? Yeah. Bennett loves me, this I know, for his good grub tells me so. He gives me tobacco for my use, fine cut course and the snooze. Yes, Bennett loves me, yes, Bennett loves me, yes, Bennett loves me, his good grub tells me so. And that kind of, that kind of spirit, you know, is about the only thing you can say positive about the camps. The, the CP organized uh, uh, debates and discussions inside the camps. It was a perfect kind of uh, workers' university. It's kind of interesting how that worked. Here is a march down the, down the main street, uh, Bridge Street in Princeton. So these, these would be the, 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 uh, the unemployed, the, the coal miners who were on strike, joined by the guys from the uh, airport in the relief camp. There we are. This is a, a, a well-famous picture organized by the party again in Vancouver, in Stanley Park, in fact, in 30, 35, just before the onto Ottawa trek. Uh, the mothers 
uh, out to abolish the relief camps, our boys. That's, uh, that was the, the designation they gave to the guys in the camps. And this is in the form of a heart, you see. So that was how, and, and the photograph is quite well known, quite popular. And this is, this is what, the, what the unemployed uh, men wanted. They felt they had been rejected by society. They had no job, they had no money, but they wanted to be citizens. They didn't want to be transients. And transients, of course, th these, these, th these men were joined not simply Vancouver and BC people, but also people from the East Coast who had come west on the trains looking for work. Because in BC, you can sleep out. Whereas you try that in Regina in February, it's not, not a possibility. This is another song uh, which is sung widely during the 30s. It came, comes from Joe Hill of the Wobblers, the industrial workers of the world. It's called The Tramp. Which reflected the lifestyle, quote unquote, of many of these people. If you all will shut your trap, I will tell you about a chap who was broke and up against it too for fair. He was not the kind to shirk, he was looking hard for work, but he heard the same old story everywhere. Tramp, 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 keep on a tramping, nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will wear the ball and chain, keep on tramping, that's the best thing you can do. Down the street, you know. He walked up. Walked he walked up and down the street till the shoes fell off his feet. In a house he spied a woman cooking stew. And he said, how do you do? May I chop some wood for you? What the woman told him made him feel so blue. Tramp, 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 keep on a tramping. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will wear the ball and chain. Keep on tramping, that's the best thing you can do. Across the street, a sign he read, work for Jesus, so it said. And he said, here is my chance, I'll surely try. So he knelt upon the floor, till his knees got rather sore. But at eating time, he heard the preacher cry. Tramp, 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 keep on a tramping. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will wear the ball and chain. Keep on tramping, that's the best thing you can do. Down the street he met a cop, and the copper made him stop. And he asked him, when did you blow into town? Come with me up to the judge. But the judge, he said, oh fudge, bums that have no money needn't come around. Tramp, 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 keep on a tramping. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will wear the ball and chain. Keep on tramping, that's the best thing you can do. Finally came the happy day when his life did pass away. He was sure he'd go to heaven when he died. When he reached the pearly gate, well, Santa Pete, the mean old skate, slammed the gate right in his face and loudly cried. Tramp, 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 keep on a tramping. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will wear the ball and chain. Keep on tramping, that's the best thing you can do. In despair, he went to hell with the devil there to dwell for the reason he'd no other place to go. And he said, I'm full of sin, so for Christ's sake, let me in. But the devil told him, beat it, you're a bow. Trap, 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 keep on the tramping. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will wear the ball and chain. Keep on trapping, that's the best thing you can do. So that's sardonic humor, you know, that, that black, that black humor. <laughs> Here's another piece. Why don't you read that piece from... That's this because is... my name is next to it. That's why I'm reading it. I like that. That's good. That's good. <laughs> this is called organization. John, John has a tenuous relationship with scripts. <laughs> so I have to sort of kick him under the table. <laughs> anyway, this is another piece from the, from the um, under the Burrard Street Bridge University professor. Now, 
you'll notice in the Joe Hill song that, that the images of religion come in again and again because one of the common cultural features that united people in British North America was Christianity. So that um, allusions to the pearly gates and St. Peter and, and all of that sort of thing were, were part of the air people breathed. So when you're going to make up songs and poems and, and cultural material to express the situation that you're in, you're going to use the language that everybody understands, which in this culture at that time was Christian, which leads me to this prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in Ottawa, <laughs> Bennett be thy name. Give us this day our bowl of soup and forgive us our trespasses on the CPR and the CNR as we forgive the bulls for chasing us. Lead us not into the hands of the RCMP nor yet to the relief camps for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory until there's an election. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Not that that did them a heck of a lot of good. Have we got patello in here? We don't, do we? What? We don't, do we have patello in here? We don't have patello in here, do we? We have we? patello in here, no. Well, we've got to do patello. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I am subverting the script here, and I'm gonna, we're going to do patello. All right. Because um, the other cultural form that people used besides Christianity was pop songs of the time. And at this time, Patello then was the premier of British Columbia, and Patello used to fly back and forth to Ottawa to consult with his um, uppers in Ottawa to try and figure things out. Meanwhile, these guys were dragging along the trains on the ground, so they had Patello up there and the guys down here, and they made up this song. It's based on the, songs if I, on the song, If I Had the Wings of an Angel, and it's called If I Had a Plane Like Patello. Oh, if I had a plane like Patello, oh, these high mountain ranges I'd fly, wah, wah, wah. And I'd fly to the city of Ottawa, where they say all our grievances lie. But now we're in British Columbia, and this is our domiciled home. And we've all had our fill of those train rides we no longer desire for to roam. So will follow the birds to Victoria to try to prevail upon Duff. That it's work with a wage that we're after, so cut out this transient stuff. <laughs> okay, you can turn that connection. Yeah. Connect us. So this, this presentation started off being about a strike. So we've been talking about relief camps and unemployed workers and all that. So what has this got to do with the strike in Princeton? Well, as John mentioned earlier, the relief campers, of course, joined the strikers on the picket lines, as well as attending the meetings of the miners. So there was, I mean, these were guys who were of the same social class, of the same um, employment kind of history. So they were very much familiar with one another, if not personally, at least from a soci sociological point of view. The strikers were led by Slim Evans, and there's going to be a bit more on him um, later on in the presentation, and many of you probably will know of him anyway. He was a communist who saw the struggle of the unemployed and the struggle of the miners as part of the breakdown of capitalism. So these guys are on strike, strike. these guys are unemployed. We're all part of the same messed up soup that we're swimming in and drowning in. So here's a brief chronology of the strike. In 1932, the Princeton coal mine is a Tullamine coal mine just across the, beyond the Brown Bridge, around the corner. It wasn't in Tullamine, but it was, it was called the Tullamine Coal Company. Uh, they, were, they, have, they were working there, been working there since the 20s, and they weren't unionized. Uh, in, 1930, in April 1932, uh, the bosses said to the miners, are you going to have to take a 10% reduction in your wages? Uh, but we'll give it back to you in September when demand goes up. This is, the coal is not particularly good coal. It's more like lignite. It's more like, it's soft, it's brown coal. It, it decays in the air, so you really want to move it through quite fast. Um, September rolls around and the miners go to the office and say, so where's our 10%? And they bugger off. So. There's no, they don't get their 10% back. And this incenses that there was a deal here. 
You said you, we get the money, we get our 10% back. No. They decided to unionize and they called in Slim Evans. Now, how they managed to do this, I don't know. Slim Evans at that time was, was in Drumheller and he had been working for the Workers' Unity League of Canada. Um, and that was a, a, a collect, it was a, it was a, 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 a workers central. It was rather like the BC Fed or the CLC. It was a, it was a, a, an organization which had as its members a few dozen unions and the unions were revolutionary unions. They were not about, they were not like AFL unions. They were industrial unions in which everybody in the industry was meant to be belong, not, not, uh, like the car industry in those days, which was the, the door handle polishers brotherhood and the, the, uh, the brotherhood of uh, people putting in the glass in the windows. I mean, 20 or 30 sub trades. Uh, now it's called UAW, and that was the, the, one of the industrial the movements in the 30s of bringing together these smaller unions into a big collective. Well, that was also the Workers' Unity League idea, the idea of industrial unions. They brought in Slim, and Slim said, how much are you working? And they said, a, a day a week. He said, listen, give me a call when you're working seven days a week, because then we'll have some bargaining power. They did this in November, and uh, called the, they, they, he, they called him somehow, or wrote to him perhaps, I don't know. He came and held a meeting down where the tunnel is. The tunnel runs from, from the Similkameen across to the Tullamine. As you come down the long hill, the tunnel is going underneath you, joining together the two rivers. And that was, there was a, a railway, a rail, the railway depot was down there and a whole bunch of cheap houses were down there. And that's where people met in the dark because they were afraid of being blacklisted or deported because I've, I figure a, th a third of the guys at least were East, Eastern European and, uh, and may not have had the right papers mm -hmm. and so were at the risk of being deported, certainly given the changes in the Immigration Act. So he met down there and he, he talked to them and he said, okay, let's, let's form the union. They formed the local union and, and went, to the, went to the boss and said, uh, we have a union, we want our 10% back. And that was all they asked for, just to get the 10% back. Again, the, the bosses told them to flake off. So they said, okay, we're going on strike. They went on strike. A week later, the company caved in and they got their 10% back. Fabulous, wonderful, end of story. You'd think end of story, but no. Uh, the mine manager was a fellow called John Bennett, and John Bennett, I think, had a certain animus against the union, and he said, uh, uh, coming up to Christmas, that we'd be working in the mine on Christmas Eve. Now, as I said, many of these miners were Eastern European, uh, and, and the practice in Eastern Europe was not to celebrate Christmas on Christmas Day, but Christmas Eve. And so they said, no, we're not going to work on Christmas Eve. Not going to happen. He says, anybody not working on Christmas Eve is going to get fired. Three or four people stayed out. They were fired. The union comes in again, a strike. A week later, they got the, the company caves in again. John Bennett, as my manager, is fired. So they've got their 10% back and they're not working Christmas Eve. Fabulous. You think this would be the end of the story? No. <laughs> it goes on from there. But at the same time as this is going on, management and miners, we have a third element here, and it's a fellow called Dave Taylor. Dave Taylor is the editor of the Similkameen Star, or the Princeton Star. It had various names. And he is a vitriolic anti-communist. And he starts filling the paper with the most vile allegations against the miners and against the Communist Party and against these dupes who have been led astray by Slim Evans um, to support the strike. And this is obviously planned in Moscow. The Politburo is sitting down saying, comrades, how should we close down Princeton? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an absurd fantasy that he has. And the paper is, gets more and more full. It's a six-pager in those days. And you know, three, three of the pages would be anti-strike anti stuff. They're quite amazing. This is uh, 
uh, one of the sources for the work we did to produce the book. There was in Vancouver, this, the CP in Vancouver also organized a paper called The Unemployed Worker. And our two sources were the unemployed worker and their accounts of the strike, and the RCMP secret reports, which um, were obtained under a Freedom of Information Act by Whitaker and Gregory Keeley. And they've now produced, well, they then produced four enormous volumes with all of these secret reports in. So between the RCMP reports on the one hand and the union reports on the other, and Dave Taylor's allegations, we could bring together the story as a story and understand what was going on in this whole thing. This is, this is a cartoon from, from the, the faith. You see the same, the same kind of sardonic humor, the same kind of, this is not a victim. This is, <laughs> this is, uh, and some of the other, some of the other cartoons are, are equally, equally funny. Um, so the, when the strike happens, uh, the RCMP, sorry, the, the BC Provincial Police call in uh, a detachment of mounted police. So there's about 25 to 30 police involved in this thing. And there's a baton charge. Uh, the, the miners have a picket line across the road going down to the mine, and there's a baton charge against that by the police. That's one thing that people remembered, is that there was a baton charge here mounted police with, with uh, truncheons, spring-loaded truncheons, very unpleasant. Hitting women and children, one woman had a broken arm, uh, the, 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 they were forced across the river, which the, the, the unemployed worker said they were forced into the river. Well, the river only had two inches of water in it. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge thing, but nonetheless. Uh, one of the picketers was arrested for singing a song on the King's Highway. This, this is an offence. So here's the, here's the song. Maybe you want to say who these people are? I've said yeah. who John Bennett is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, various names come up in this song. This song was, the, these songs, by the way, the, 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 the Broad Street Bridge songs were collected by Phil Thomas, who collected many BC songs, which John and I are proud to sing. And this is one of the songs that he collected here in Princeton, actually. And... Um, the picketer who was singing this song got arrested, and his offense was literally singing a song on the King's Highway. So if you're ever walking down the King's Highway, don't bloody well sing, otherwise you might get arrested. Because who knows, these laws might still be on the books. <laughs> so as John, as John mentioned, John Bennett, who's mentioned in the song, was the manager of the Tullamine Mine. The Board of Trade, uh, th these are, this is what they used to be called the Board of Trade, and then now they're called Chambers of Commerce. But, but um, the Board of Trade were, were the instigators of the Citizens League. And the Citizens League was a, was a hysterical bunch of local burghers who, who were really up in arms about this strike. So the Board of Trade appears in this song. Dave Taylor, as John mentioned, is the editor of the newspaper who stirs up this anti-communist boiling water and uh, the hysteria and the thousands of column inches of anti-communist diatribe. Now you can join in. You can join in on this Absolutely. one. It's very easy. You all know it. Oh, the cops will have a hell of a time, parlez-vous. The, the cops will have a hell of a time, parlez-vous. The cops will have a hell of a time, trying to break the picket line, inky pinky, parlez-vous. Now you notice this was actually uh, a First World War, Madame, First World War song, Mademoiselle from Armatière. So again, they take the popular songs that are in the air and they recycle them. The Board of Trade is a bunch of thugs, parlez-vous. The Board of Trade is a bunch of thugs, parlez-vous. The Board of Trade is a bunch of thugs, we hate to see their ugly mugs, inky pinky, parlez-vous. John Bennett is the son of a bitch, parlez-vous. John Bennett is the son of a bitch, parlez-vous. John Bennett is the son of a bitch, our labor, it has made him rich, inky pinky, parlez-vous. Dave Taylor. Dave Taylor is a parasite. Parlez-vous. Dave Taylor is a parasite. Parlez-vous. Dave Taylor is a parasite. Abuses workers day and night. Inky pinky parlez-vous. Oh, 
Princetonites will shout hooray, parlez-vous. Princetonites will shout hooray, parlez-vous. Oh, Princetonites will shout hooray when Tullamine miners gain the day. Hinky pinky, parlez-vous. <laughs> The, uh, the Citizens League did many things. Uh, one of them was to uh, put, up, put up a cross, a burning cross, above uh, on the hill on the other side of the Brown Bridge. You're looking down the street, there's a Brown Bridge at the end, up on the hill. This is the Klan in Vancouver. Um, there was a branch of the Klan in Princeton. Um, or again, organized, probably organized by the Chamber of Commerce or Dave Taylor or any of those people. Um, uh, this is in Shaughnessy, of course. <laughs> the, the big house in Shaughnessy. What is now Canuck Place? Say again? It's Canuck Place now. Oh. Canuck Place. Yeah. Uh, well, happy days. <laughs> uh, and uh, the Klan put up notices on workers' doors, uh, threatening them with, with uh, assault. Uh, one guy was assaulted on the, on the Round Bridge itself and beaten up. And, and when it came to trial, the, the other, the, the, guy, the guy charged was one of the Burr family. The Burr family ran a garage and they were well-known uh, Tories. The Tor they were, they, I think they were Tories 30 years ago. They were probably further right back then. Anyway, he was charged and they found no evidence against him. So, um, Evans was kidnapped. They organized the arrange, the, the, to arrange to kidnap him. He was a candidate in the election coming, the upcoming election. He was speaking at Colmont and they found his, they found where he was speaking. He was having a cup of tea with a, with a lady up in Colmont and they surrounded the house. They forced him out. They put him in a car and took him to um, the train, the closest train station, put him on the train and said, if you come back, this, you're going to be in trouble. He came back the next day, but so uh, they, 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 this, they tried this twice. Here's Blind Bill. Blind? Yeah, I'm on now. You're on now? Go yes. for it. So Evans gets kidnapped, Blind Bill gets evicted from his house, and the Citizens League gets formed, and these are upright, upstanding citizens of Princeton. Now the interesting thing about it is that Princeton, all these mining towns that Ron was talking about earlier today, were incorporated in the 1890s, between 1890 and 1900. Princeton was a mining town. It did not get incorporated until 1952. And we don't know exactly why, and that was instigated by a Eastern European miner. Plekash was his name. And we theorize that the reason for that is that people like the Board of Trade didn't want a municipal government because all the miners lived in town and you didn't want these Eastern European bohunks voting for a town council and deciding what's going to happen in town. So Princeton didn't get incorporated until 1952. So the Citizen League, Citizens League is, is the kind of mentality that created that situation. Um, and it also probably egged Dave Taylor on with his anti-communist diatribe. And this, this is how we first connected with the strike was through this poem. John and I were doing research for the, our book Dead Horse on the Tullamine, which is songs and poems from the Princeton Papers. And we came across this poem and we thought, what, yeah. what is this about? Yeah. And... Um, Shall I read it? Yes, you should it says, read it. It says, um, this is a... a read, read it from your paper and stand I, in front of it. I will. Stand, stand here, like this. Okay. It, the, the tombstone is, in fact, an actual tombstone. Like we got a picture of it. It's in the book. I, don't, I think we may have it in here. Um, it, in memoriam, Princeton killed winter 1932-33 by E. Ivanskovich and his dupes. R.I.P. Uh, Ivanskovich is Evans, but he, he's a communist, therefore he must be Russian, so he's Ivanskovich. <laughs> Tread lightly, pilgrim, on this sterile ground. T'was once a thriving, bustling town. When the Reds came and took it o'er, prosperity went to a kindlier shore. Ivanskovich and his cohorts rule. The red flag is now sung in school. The mines are closed. The town is dead. The children now cry out for bread. 
So pilgrim, walk with muted tread. You are passing o'er dishonored dead. Through cowardice, we must allow that Ivanskovich is ruling now. The front page of the paper. I mean, I mean, he 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 lost. All, I think all sense of proportion. It was quite astonishing. That was April 1933. That that appeared. Um, Evans Evans got arrested, and charged under Section 98. Section 98 had been brought in shortly after the end of the First World War because they were afraid of, again, communists, uh, atheists, dwarfs, feminists, unionists, people with bicycles. I mean, uh, you know, the normal kind of concatenation of, of, of enemies. Um, and you could get 20 years. You get 20 years if, you, if your house or your hotel or your, or your uh, rooms were used by uh, anybody uh, uh, charged under this thing, you also got 20 years. So, so the union couldn't hold meetings in uh, any building in Princeton. And, that, and he was arrested, he was charged, he was charged that Arthur H. Evans in the months of November and December did at Princeton in the county of Yale, province of British Columbia, unlawfully, now listen to this, unlawfully advocate, advise and defend the use without authority of law of force as a means of accomplishing a change in the governmental and industrial life of Canada, contrary to the provisions of the criminal code. It's a strike for 10%. It's like he's not overthrowing the government. It's just an absurdity. But nonetheless, he was charged and he was found guilty. Here he is going off to jail. This is again a picture in the, in the unemployed worker. No regrets. Cheerful. He knows, he, knows, he knows his life is, is entirely in the hands of the people who are going to jail him. While in jail, the mortgage on his house ran out. He had got a mortgage from... Oh, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. Yeah. I love the fellow in the front with a club. Do you see this guy here? That's who you want when the when the, <laughs> the beta's come round. <laughs> These guys are defending the house. It says, uh, what does it say? Pick, pick it, pick it line. I can't read the rest. Can something home? Anyway, it's, this is this is his house, and they defended it. But eventually, 70 bailiffs and cops uh, drove these guys off and uh, evicted the family, uh, his his wife and his daughter, who was uh, seven years old. 150 police, sorry, uh, finally evicted by 150 feet police. Do you want to carry on? Yeah. <coughs> So there's something inspiring about this whole story, and, and it, it's, it's humbling to us in the 21st century to hear what these people did in order to defend what they thought was right. Um, why does this story matter now? Well, it's important because the nature of economic and industrial relations at the time were very different from what they are now. Princeton in 1932, the coal mines were the backbone of the town economy. Now, most people don't know that Princeton is here because of coal mines. It's, it's, it, there would have not have been a town here. There were ranchers and there were sort of some trading centers, but, but the coal mines is what generated the formation of the town. The jobs and the mine managers were local and known. There was direct contact between the workers, the community, and the managers portrayed in, a th in song. These are things of the past. Who's, who's the manager of the Copper Mountain Mine? They've got 450 employees up there. Whose name would you mention? You wouldn't know. He's up probably in Tokyo somewhere or something like that. Nowadays, all these kind of corporate interests are multinational and shares are owned by people all over the world. There's no, there's no one to aim at. Whereas there, you could say, there's John Bennett, he's the manager of the mine. There's the head office, blah, 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 blah. So the connections were much more straightforward. People could make the connections. People feel much more powerless today in the forces of these international corporations and the economy, the way that it's run. 
strike harkens back to a time when social economic forces were more transparent. People felt empowered to take action. I think that that's what to us is so inspiring about this is these people felt, given the fact that most of the men in BC were unemployed, they still were politically active. These strikers were vulnerable to the forces that were around them. They still stood up. That they felt empowered enough that, and they kept their sense of humor with those cartoons, with the songs, that they, that there was a potency there which you just don't see today. And, and, and to me that's inspiring and to me that's why it matters today. There are echoes of the strike in Princeton today. The stories of the KKK form part of Princeton's story, folklore. When we first arrived in Princeton, we were told about the Burning Cross. And I thought, what? What, what are they talking I had no clue what the connection was, but I had heard about the Burning Cross. Um, there was an old timer interviewed in the Princeton Museum who told the story of the kidnapping, but would not give the names of the kidnappers. Um, he was a descendant of one of the Pioneers family and had a column in the local paper and wanted to write about the strike but was not was encouraged not to you don't want to you don't want to make waves um, one of the people who used to live here his dad was in the police force that used the batons charging the strikers and he said well you know they didn't really, they just kind of hit them on the bum and you know i thought hang on but that was the story that he got from his dad so echoes are still around um, you see, there's no one alive anymore that you can talk to about this. So people get their stories, and the stories have to fit with the family's mythology and the family's, the family's myths. Anyway, it was one of Princeton's finest hours, and we had to search around for it through the RCMP files and through the newspapers. Um, we decided not to interview people because of, first of all, the unreliability of the story that you got, and also the fact that people have a vested interest in a certain side of the story. So we use only written sources. This is, uh, this is how we, we came into, into doing this. This is Phil Thomas. Phil Thomas uh, collected uh, vernacular songs in BC from 1954 to about 1975 and found something like 500 songs. Um, many of them having to do with the basic industries in BC, mining, logging, fishing, uh, some other songs of settlement, and some historical material too. Um, it was working with Phil, we worked with Phil from 68 till his death. When did he die? 2000? 2007. 2007, so we were he was married to Hilda Thomas, who was a, who was a, an NDP, -er, uh, very active in the feminist movement in in Vancouver. I worked with Hilda politically, and I worked with Phil uh, on the songs. And so all these, uh, I, I edited his book, and I put together the collection for the arch for the sound archives in Victoria. Um, Phil had a notion that the songs that he was looking for had to have been made um, pretty much by people who uh, were now dead. He, he thought, and I think it's fairly well understood, that people don't learn songs after the age of 20 or thereabouts, something like that. Um, and radio comes into BC round about 1926 or thereabouts. And the, one of the things that was very big in radio was picking up the big stations in Dallas uh, at nighttime. You get that bounced effect. And, and so we got Jimmy Rogers coming out the yin yang. I mean, it's just an enormous amount of, uh, of stuff sitting on top of whatever people were making, whatever music people were making here in the 20s. It became overloaded, as it were, as it still is, of course, with uh, music from other cultures, uh, mostly, quote, country, unquote, uh, from Kentucky or Tennessee, or uh, that's where the singing, the singing voices seem to come from. But there was a group we heard from Nelson who sounded as if they came from Bowling Green, Kentucky. And they, they were Canadian. That's just, but that's how you're supposed to sing. I mean, that was, that's one of the messages of, 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 of 
popular music. Uh, in any event, uh, if you uh, if you uh, learn the song before 20 and radio comes in in 26, and the guys who you're going to collect from are now 120, so they've all gone. There's no one left who has got those songs, unless they've passed on to a son or a daughter, or, uh, and there's not much evidence of that. But also Phil found stuff in the paper. And when we came to Princeton in, when did we come to Princeton? About 20, huh? 2007. Um, we came to the archives, uh, the Princeton archives, and found a complete run of the local paper. It was at that point un digitized. We went through the paper from beginning to end uh, and to write the, the first book we wrote, which is a collection of songs, uh, songs um, made up in the, in the valley, here in the Sorkin Valley. We found the songs uh, and here is, here is one of them. And Bennett comes up in this one as well. There's a mine in the west where the Tullamine flows, and they're digging up coal by the day. What key is this? But the methods they use and the amount of abuse is driving the miners away. John Bennett was head of that Tullamine spread, and Bill Strang was boss down the mine. John Bennett was known as a son of a bitch, and Bill was a dirty old swine. But there must have been more to the song. Bill, Bill Strang died the following year in a, in a rock fall in the mine. And I say John Bennett was fired and went off somewhere, somewhere else. But that's a uh, tune, does a tune ring a bell? Yeah. Ivan Skavinsky Skavar, written by uh, Percy. Percy French. Yes. Okay, the next encounter with this thing. Oh. Me. Was this? Me. That's you, okay. Me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a company, I think they're out of Winnipeg, and, and, they, and they create, hmm? Precinct. Yes, they, they create local histories, and, and it's kind of like blah, 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 your town here, and you kind of stick in your town, and you send them their stories, and they create this book. And it's this thick, and it's in the Princeton Museum, and it costs, when it first came out, was quite expensive. And there's this picture in it. And you go, what the heck is this picture? And there we are, in memoriam, Princeton killed winter 32, 33 by Ivanskovich and his dupes. So that was connected to the poem. And underneath the picture, it said, a local prank. They didn't know. They or, didn't know or, 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 they, or didn't know. they didn't want to say, just the same way they didn't want to put Soviet Princeton up on the, on the electronic signboard. It's, it, <laughs> <laughs> plus a <ça> change. <laughs> So that, that was our next encounter with the strike. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's kind of the story in a nutshell with the little side trips here and there and whatever. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, questions? You like questions, maybe? How did the strike end? Uh, they won the strike, but the mine closed two years later and never reopened. Because the demand for, the demand for coal uh, was being looked after by that. Uh, they thought originally they could sell it to the railways for use, use on the VV&E, okay. but no, it's not good enough. It's, 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 it's the quality, quality wasn't good yeah. enough. Yeah. Just a comment about the relief camps. Uh, the relief camps come World War II. Many of them are used to... Japanese uh, internment. Indeed, indeed. But you can see the, the theatrical scene of having a cabin on center stage and, and somebody just sort of turning over a sign like Brecht, you know. <laughs> it's, 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 now, it's now 1951, this is now a... <laughs> I just wondered what, after, after the, they got the 10% and after they got Christmas Eve off, what were they striking for? Uh, they weren't. I thought they were still on strike after... Uh, no, they went on strike to, against the... the uh, uh, they wanted the, the contract to, they, I'm sorry, did I miss this out? They, the company again said a 10% reduction. And they said, no, we've got a contract, see? So I'm sorry, my, my fault, I left it out. Yes? Did Slim roll through town uh, after the strike at some point, uh, maybe raising money for the, for the, the McKinsey Papadou Battalion? 
Not that we know of. Not that we know of, but it makes up, it, it's, it sounds reasonable. Slim. Yes, yes. Slim died in 1943 in a car accident in Vancouver. Uh, but he was also had, he was also active in the in in the the uh, mine mill strike, in Trail. The organizing drive. Uh, yeah, the organizing drive. And uh, there's there's some poems he made, which are in the paper, which is probably worth looking at. Yeah. Well, you, uh, you mentioned that Evans went to prison or Section 98 or was charged. Yeah. Found How long was his sentence? I think it was three years, and I think he served one. Something like, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, any more? Good. Thank you. We're done. Good. Thank you.